Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest, Dr. Walt Larimore, who's here to share with us his new book, At First Light, a true World War II story of a hero, his bravery, and an amazing horse. So welcome to the show, Dr. Walt Larimore. Marianne, it's great to be with you. Thanks for the privilege. Well, what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this book. I I was just so touched reading it. When did you get to the point where you were able to sit down with your dad and get this information for this book? Well, that's a great question. And, And before it, I want to tell your listeners that I've done lots of interviews about the book and very few, I can count on two fingers, the hosts who have said, I've read the book. And and that's what you do for all of your interviews, don't you? Oh, we have to. Yes. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> well, blessing. well, my my brothers and I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana with my three brothers. We uh, were all sons of a college professor, my dad. Uh, we knew he had fought in the war because there were pictures uh, of generals, army generals from World War II in his little office that were all signed to him from General Eisenhower, as well as other generals. Uh, He had a shadow box full of medals, valor. In fact, every medal of valor the Army gives except the Medal of Honor. And and he had lost a leg. We knew he had an artificial leg. But he would never, Marianne, he would never talk about any of that until his and mom's 45th wedding anniversary. And all of us boys were gathered around him after a, a Cajun meal just south of Baton Rouge, and we were having a beer together and talking. And one of my brothers said, well, now, Dad, really, how did you lose your leg? And I don't know if it was just a nostalgia of the moment or that he was far enough out that some of the the stuff that he did that was top secret was declassified uh, and he could talk about it, or he just wanted to talk to his boys. But he began to tell stories. And the more he told, Quite frankly, the more we didn't believe him. In fact, one of my brothers said, "Dad, have you had a few too many beers?" <laughs> you know, and uh, but he he told those stories uh, to friends, to colleagues. He was a scoutmaster, so he told them to the scouts. And as a as a scientist, as a physician, as a person who had written research and understood research, I knew that liars tend not to tell the same story every time. But his details were always exactly the same, which struck me as as interesting. And then when he passed away, I found up in our attic a a footlocker, an army footlocker that contained about 450 of his letters home to friends and his parents, as well as several history books, including the history of the 30th, 30th Infantry Regiment, the history of the 3rd Infantry Division. And these books actually, and the letters, actually recounted the stories that he told. So I just began kind of typing them up to to get a sense of of that amazing life that he had, almost a Forrest Gump-type life. And 16 years later, wouldn't you know, it turned out to be a book. Well, 16 years. I'm I'm so glad that you took the time to do this. It's quite a remarkable book. It's so well-written. Can you tell us a little bit what your dad was like when he was growing up? He was a juvenile delinquent. <laughs> he, he, he was he was an only child growing up in Memphis, Tennessee. His mom was uh, the executive of uh, the head of the largest law firm in Memphis. And so she was often gone uh, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, six days a week. His dad was a conductor, a Pullman conductor on the Illinois Central Railway line, which ran from New Orleans to Chicago. He would get on in Chicago and then ride up and down the the rails, often gone days at a time. So that left dad as a latchkey child. And he was mischievous and not very good in school. Those uh, academic topics didn't mean much to him. And so his uh, mom tried putting him in a finishing school for children, which was an absolute failure. She tried vacation Bible school and Sunday school, and that didn't really seem to help very much. Finally, the Boy Scouts helped helped a bit, uh, getting out to learn to camp and use a compass and and uh, learn to white, ride horses and and shoot uh, weapons. That was exciting to him, and he was good at that. And also, he fell in love with horses. Uh, there was a stable not far from their home in Memphis where the horses 
the big old draft horse, horses that pulled the trolleys around Memphis were kept. And he just had an innate ability, Marianne, with, with horses and fell in love with him. But his uh, friends and he got into more mischief than you could count. They they swam the Mississippi River almost dying without permission in the, during the flood of, of 1934. I mean, just crazy things. So finally, to save his life, his mom and dad sent him to military school. And so he spent four years of high school in military school. And Marianne, it was there that he really found himself, his love of the military and his love of leadership, of servant leadership that he displayed the rest of his military life. At what point did he go to Fort Benning? Well, after uh, he was in his senior year of military school, Gulf Coast Military Academy down in uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, he fell in love uh, down there with uh, Marilyn Fountain was her name, and they began to to date. Her dad was uh, a commander of the Army National Reserve <clears throat> up in Iowa, and then after the war began, he he was uh, on General Patton's staff. So dad was exposed to the military through Colonel Fountain and through the military school. And then his senior year was when Pearl Harbor uh, occurred because he had done so well in military school. He was a leader, uh, graduated with honors. He was chosen to go to officer candidate school in Fort Benning when he was 17. And he's the youngest ever graduate of officer candidate school. Marianne, normally to get into officer candidate school, uh, a young person has to have completed college. Uh, having some ROTC training helps too. Well, here he was going into officer candidate school even before college as a you know, high school student. In fact, he graduated from officer candidate school and then two weeks later got his Eagle Scout <laughs> award. So he was just a, a young whippersnapper, younger than anyone else in his class. And yet he finished at the top of his class. He's probably one of those people that's so brilliant, he, you know, just anything will kind of keep him bored. So having that kind of structure with the Eagle Scouts and the military probably sounds like it was really his thing. No, I think you're absolutely right. The, the discipline, the purpose, the excitement that, that uh, being in the military generated is what took he and so many of the 16 million men and women who served during World War II you know, into into the war, but at least for frontline people, my my dad was the youngest frontline officer in World War II, at least in Europe, and also one of the most awarded uh, uh, frontline officers in World War II. Um, going over there, kind of their John Wayne, let's be a hero, let's kick the heil out of Hitler uh, personalities quickly changed once they were on the battlefield. The horribleness, the terribleness of war hit them just smack dab in the face, literally, at least on the front lines, the moment they arrived. That must have been such a awakening in many ways. Was your dad very forthcoming in talking about those days? Once he started talking, he, he was. In fact, of those first three days, he, he was... Uh, in the Southern front, there were two fronts, <clears throat> excuse me, in Europe, there was the Northern front that everyone knows about. It began uh, the invasion of Normandy, what is called D-Day, and then went across uh, Northern France, liberating Paris uh, in August of 1944. And then uh, the terrific battles in, in Europe uh, before getting into Germany and uh, obviously eventually liberating Germany. The Northern Front guys fought for 336 days, uh, horrible, horrific battles. But most people don't know the Southern Front, where my dad was, uh, went on for 913 days. The Northern Front guys had the D-Day, one D-Day, but the Southern Front guys had five D-Days. The Northern Front guys liberated Paris in August of 44, but the Southern Front guys had already liberated Rome two months earlier in June of 1944. But that was forgotten because they happened to liberate Rome on June 5th, 1944. And something happened the next day on June 6th, 1944. That was the invasion of Normandy. And so my dad and his colleagues that were all going to be front page stories on June 6th, 1944, were pushed back to the 14th, 15th, 16th page of, of the papers and, and 
were were forgotten. But he his first uh, nights in battle were in Anzio Beachhead, which was in uh, January of 1944. It was a stalemate that lasted four months. Marianne, it was almost not almost. It was like the trench warfare of World War One. The men had had landed. They were on a strip of land that was 10 miles deep, 15 miles wide, and completely surrounded by mountains on which the Germans had every piece of artillery that you could imagine, including the largest cannons ever produced uh, at that time. Those cannons called Anzio Annies could shoot projectiles the size of a refrigerator accurately 20, 30 miles. And so all the guys on Anzio had to bury themselves in. They had to dig in in the middle of a horrible winter that then went into a springtime. And because they were in swamps, they were invaded by malaria. But his first night, Marianne and Anzio, he was an ammunition and pioneer platoon, meaning he and his men took ammunition to the front at nighttime. They took uh, weapons to the front at nighttime. They put took food and supplies. They had to defuse bombs and mines. They had to lay mines. They had to lay wire, often within 10 to 15 yards of the enemy, where they could actually hear the enemy talking. And the first night, he was working with a private, and that private was defusing a mine, made a mistake, and blew his face off right, right next to, to my dad. And the next night, dad was that they would go to work at dark and they work through the night. And then at first light, they would leave the battlefield. And he was leaving just before first light with one of his men. And there was an uh, anti-artillery uh, gun that the Germans had called the 88, meaning an 88 uh, millimeter projectile or a three, a three inch bullet, if you would, three inches across. Uh, the Germans shot an 88 projectile and it went through the man that my dad was walking next to it, literally cut the man in half right next to him and both sides of the body fell on either side of my dad. And then the third night that he was in the battlefield, a brand new recruit uh, was with him. Two German soldiers should, stood up waving a white flag, yelling comrade, comrade, which was their way of indicating they wanted to surrender. But dad by this point knew that evil that infested particularly the SS men who were fighting on the front. And he knew that they did not follow the rules of war. And he knew there were fake surrenders. And as his new recruits stood up to take the two men, dad screamed at him, get down, get down. Both of the German soldiers dropped to the ground and snipers blew off the heads of both of his men. So in three days, my dad began to realize, as did his comrades on the front, how horrible death was and battle was, and yet they believed so much in liberty and so much in freedom and so much not in conquering Northern Africa, not in conquering Sicily or Italy or France or Germany, but liberating them and give them the liberty, the freedom that I hope we will continue to enjoy even to today. We are all so grateful of the service and sacrifice so many men and women gave during World War II. The generations here now are enjoying that freedom. I would hate to think of what the world would look like had the Germans won. You know, I think you're exactly right. The 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 horror of of, of fascism, of Nazism. Uh, my dad and the men he served with got got to see that. They got to they got to see the uh, Italian and French and German villages that had been destroyed by that. They got to see. Uh, people who had had to live under that and the horrors that were inflicted upon them to be able to liberate those people gave them a great joy. And, and I think when they came back, it gave them a different way of breathing. I mean, they, they literally considered each breath a, a gift that, that they had. Um, often people would try to call uh, those men and women heroes who had come back. And dad was vehemently opposed to that. He said, uh, Marianne, he would say the heroes are the ones that are buried there. They're the ones that gave all of their tomorrows so that we can even have a day. And so I join you in being grateful for the two million who fought in um, in Europe and the 14 million who fought elsewhere around the globe or even just even just stayed home. Uh, the millions and millions of women who took jobs that men had left. The millions and millions of families 
who lived on ration cards, who who grew victory gardens, who bought war bonds to support the greatest industrial military effort that that the world had had ever seen. And without it, I don't think the evil of fascism and Nazism could have been crushed, or or of Imperial Japan could have been crushed the way that it was. It was a horrible war on both sides, but thank God for the freedom we have today because of it. Yeah, thank God for that. At what point did your father's equestrian skills come into play? Well, throughout his childhood, he he was a master horseman. In fact, I told you about the stables he was working in. Uh, the stable masters would tell my grandma that he had a way, he was a horse whisperer. They didn't have the term then, but they said he had a way of communicating them with sounds and gurgles and looks that they that they understood. He went to, uh, on his uh, ninth birthday, the Lipizzans from Vienna, Austria, were touring in the United States, and his mom took him as a birthday gift to see the Lipizzans. But uh, he spent that entire day in the stables of the Lipizzans, just brushing Lipizzans and and shoveling their manure and and watering them under the watchful eyes of the of the master riders. But one of the stablemen uh, noticed how Dad could communicate with those horses and how they understood him and how they'd lower their head to nuzzle him. And he did something that was illegal. You could not sit on the back of a Lipizzan, at least at the Spanish riding school in Vienna, Austria, until you had gone through six years of training as a writer, or A-I-T-E-R, they call them. But that man, that man was so engrossed with how dad could communicate with horses, he actually hoisted him up and let him sit on Lipizzan. And dad later wrote that he he made a decision that day that one day he would go to Europe and see the Lipizzans. And as you know, he did, but in a way. He didn't think that he would. Uh, it, throughout his training, uh, he he had horse experiences when he was training in Alliance, Nebraska. He had uh, experience with uh, uh, working with draft horses and competing with them in the state fair while he was while he was off uh, duty. Uh, when he was in training, every base that he went to, most of the major army bases had fox hunting as a recreation, and so he learned to become a fox hunter. And despite Rumors to the contrary, nobody, no animals killed in a fox hunt. It's mostly just learning to ride and the the fellowship and comradeship of, of being together with others who were equestrians. But he enjoyed learning about fox hunting. And then when he went to war, his first experience when he landed in northern Africa was with Moroccan warriors who rode Berber horses. And he learned to do that when he was in Naples, Florida. I did Naples, Florida. When he was in Naples, Italy, uh, waiting to go to Anzio, he was able to train with a dressage master on Napoleon horses, Neapolitan, I mean. Uh, an amazing thing that occurred was after their last D Day, which was August 15th, 1944, they were racing up through France. The uh, the army, the U.S. Army and the Allies were chasing the German 19th Army, which was reti- retreating as fast as it could, and got caught in a little gap in the mountains. The, the little gap up in France just had enough room for a rail line, uh, the Rhone River, and a two-way highway. And so the entire army got trapped there, and the U.S. had set up artillery and air, aircraft, and they bombed uh, the stragglers of the German army, literally killing thousands and thousands of men, thousands of vehicles were destroyed and set on fire. But the German army was a horse drawn army. In other words, almost all of its artillery wasn't mechanized, but was pulled by horses. And in this gap, thousands of horses were killed or wounded. And dad, because his commander of the 30th Infantry knew he was equestrian. His commander of the 3rd Infantry Division knew he was an equestrian, as they were. Uh, Had Dad volunteer, gather up some cowboys, some farm boys, and they went in and were able to identify the horses that could not be saved, and they were put down uh, humanely. He taught the boys how to do that. And then they gathered them up. They had a big roundup of the horses that, that lived, and it was one of the most joyous days of his time in the Army. Uh, he also, on Anzio and then later in the Vosges Mountains, got his commanders to allow him to rent mules from local farmers. In Anzio, uh, he trained those mules to carry ammunition to the front line at night. And the mules are brilliant animals. They knew where the 
the the the holes were in the ground. They didn't step in them. They knew where the dry path was, and they took it, led the men in it. They knew where mines were, and they would not step on him, saving lives. And most amazing, Marion. Now they're working at night. If a phosphorus flare went up, and Dad and his men were in no man's land, they were in direct sight of the enemy and the snipers and the the men in the foxholes. Well, these mules knew that when the phosphorus flare went off, they laid down flat on the ground and dad and his men could hide behind them. It was, it was just remarkable. And then oh, maybe the last and the most amazing story, I think, of his equestrianism during the war was when towards the end of the war, about a month before the end of the war, this would have been April of 1945, the U.S. Army had heard that Hitler, you know, he was trying to make the master race, the Aryan race, but he also wanted to make the master horse breed, the perfect horse for the perfect people in his view. And from 1938 on, he had Nazi veterinarians gather all of the European population of the royal horses, the Andalusians, the Frisians, uh, quarter, um, uh, quarter horses, thoroughbreds, and also glipizons to begin breeding them. And by the end of the war, he considered the Lipizzan the royal stallion, the perfect stallion, and had gathered them into a horse farm in Czechoslovakia. Well, because of the Yalta Agreement, the Russians were coming in to liberate Czechoslovakia, not the U.S. And they were eating every, killing and eating every animal they came across because they had suffered so much starvation. And in eastern Czechoslovakia, trailer of either 20 or 22 Lipizzans was captured by the Russians. All but one of the horses were killed. They were skinned, cooked, and eaten. And so the Nazi vets, who were more vets than they were Nazis, became very concerned. They contacted the Americans who decided to send in a secret mission 200 miles into Czechoslovakia. And dad was recruited for and volunteered to go on that mission along with a pilot with no identification, no dog tags. He didn't know who the pilot was. The pilot didn't know who he was. If they were captured or killed, they would be disavowed. Their family would not have life insurance benefits. If they were captured, they would be AWOL and be criminal. But they volunteered to go in. He actually found the Lipizzans and was able to fly out and report to his commanders that the Lipizzans were there. And to his credit, General Patton, approved a secret mission called Operation Cowboy, which sent a cavalry troop into Czechoslovakia and walked the Lipizzans out. I think it was about 120 miles and may have well saved the Lipizzans. It was just a heartwarming, wonderful story. Uh, Dad didn't get to see the Lipizzans come out, but he did get to see when the Austrians sent a Lipizzan, eight Lipizzans to the U.S. as a thank, thank a Thanksgiving. Uh, for saving them uh, to become part of the Quezon platoon at Arlington a Cemetery. And for years, uh, six of those Lipizzans pulled a Quezon to help bury our heroes in Arlington National Cemetery. Your father's story is just remarkable. And it, I mean, we've touched just a little bit of it. What would you say is the common thread through his story? I think perhaps the most common thread is that each of us in small ways can do great things if we choose to put all of our heart into it. He was almost derailed by something that happened towards the end of the war. Three, in fact, it was five days after he went in to, to, save, to, to um, identify the Lipizzans that he went in uh, in a battlefield on the back of a tank to save a, a, a platoon of his that was surrounded by about 150 German soldiers. He took that tank in with uh, the 50 caliber machine gun blazing. He was able to save his men and be able to pull them out. But in the midst of it, because they were the, the Germans were shooting so many rounds at him, it was called a hail of bullets, that one of them, uh, two of them struck his head, but but didn't kill him. They They hit his helmet. One of them struck his canteen, but missed him. But one of them got his leg and and shattered his his lower leg, and so uh, the the army surgeons there were able to save his life, but not his leg. But he came back to the U.S. At, as an amputee, and he found out that the army didn't really value 
uh, officers that were amputees. In fact, once you were healed, you were told you would be discharged because you were no longer considered an officer or a gentleman. Many of the men who came back in uniform with medals, especially as many medals as dad had, uh, were, were very attractive to young women who were looking for, for someone to date, but not if they were amputees. And dad found himself rejected by the army and rejected by by women as being incomplete, uh, not fully human. And it, Marianne, it deeply depressed him. But he was given the gift of, of a very wise chaplain who kind of helped center him. In fact, he, he wrote about what that chaplain told him in a letter to his mom. And he said that uh, at his lowest point, that that chaplain kind of chastised him. And he said, son, your wound will either make you a bitter person or a better person. It will either harden your heart or it will soften it. You will either be a person changed for the worse or one who chooses to make the world better. In my opinion, the chaplain said, the worst disability in life isn't being disabled. It's being disabled with a bad attitude. The Germans smashed your leg, but don't let them shatter your heart, your talents, your gifts, your will, your faith in God and his plan for you. But the choice to make the world better is really up to you. And that became a, a flag for him, a stalwart for him. And it was how he raised his boys. And I think it's a, a mantra that, that all of us could adopt. There's lots of things going wrong in our country and in our world. And we will always have trouble and troubles. But the one thing we can control is our attitude and how we face those obstacles and how we either work around them or work over them. And I'm so grateful for the legacy the heritage that that my dad uh, gave to me and gave to my brothers. I'm so glad that we have this piece of history too. Were you able to interview any of your dad's friends or people he knew for this? No, story? I was able. By the time I started the book, which was 2006, worked on it for the next 16 years, I was only able to find three survivors that he had fought with and interview them, and and they were uh, just chock full of information. I was able to find the uh, children or the spouses of another several dozen of, of men and women that he had fought with, um, in the case of women that were nurses in the hospitals that had cared for him. And their memoirs, their stories were, were incredibly helpful. Each of them reviewed anything I wrote about their mother or their father to uh, assure me that it was accurate. Uh, that's exactly how their their relatives would sound. And then I spent a great deal of time overseas in Italy, France, Germany, England, and then at military installations, museums, and archives around our country, in fact, in 16 states, pulling out documents that had never seen the light of day, memoirs, questionnaires of soldiers coming back, um, recordings of them, pictures of them. Um, my My... Dad, one of the most amazing was my dad fought the army policy for amputees, and his fight went all the way up to the Department of War uh, with the support and friendship of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, and Audie Murphy, the most decorated man in World War II, uh, a man that dad actually recovered in a hospital alongside Audie Murphy, a President Truman who befriended dad and helped him. And that, that, uh, appeal went right up to the Department of War. And I knew that it was a vicious, ugly hearing that the colonels who were hearing this appeal didn't believe that officers who were amputees had a place in their army, as they put it. And so I was rifling through over 75 cases of materials that the archivists had pulled out at the National Archives in Washington. And one day with gloves on, because they make you wear gloves, I was leafing through a, a pile of documents. And Mariana, I found the transcript of that trial. And if any, if you or if any of our listeners ever watched that movie, A Few Good Men, where uh, Tom Cruise playing the, the Navy JAG officer, the Navy lawyer, is interrogating Jack Nicholson as the Marine general. And it's this vicious, intense exchange that goes on and I found the transcript of that vicious intent um, uh, transcript. 
And it, I think it becomes two of the best chapters of the book. But to be able to actually have that information, talk to those people, learn what they saw that's not in the history books, learn what they smelled, learn, learn what they perceived, learn what they believed, learn how they responded, made this a whole different book. Because it's not a book by a historian. It's not a book of the big picture of the war. It's the book of a young teenage boy fighting for his life along with his buddies and his comrades in the very worst of conditions for the people he was liberating and for the country he would return to. Walt, where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about At First Light and your other books? Oh, well, my my website's drwalt.com, D-R-W-A-L-T.com. And the book, which is in audio format, in fact, Marianne, it's read by George Guidall, who I think is the best reader of books in history. He reads all of Stephen King's books. He's even read two versions of the Bible, <laughs> you know, if you can imagine. Uh, Vince Flynn's books, he's a remarkable, remarkable narrator. And he took what I wrote and just put it to words. It's alive in, in the audio book that he did. Every character he has a different voice for, and even German accents is wonderful. And then it's also available in elect- electric readers, electronic readers like Kindle and Nook, or as a as a book. I'm kind of still a guy that likes holding and smelling a book. So anywhere you get your books, uh, your ebooks or your audio books, uh, has at first light available. Well, Walt, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Oh, it's such a privilege, Marianne. And thank you for helping me lift up these men and women of the forgotten front uh, that they may, well, no longer be forgotten, that we can remember them and honor them uh, for the sacrifices, the suffering, and the successes that they had. And and you're helping me kind of carry out what their general, General Lucian Trustot said, we cannot look back to them if we don't look forward to the future for which they fought and died. And each of us gets to to carry that onward, hopefully to preserve, magnify, and love the freedom and the liberty that we have today. Well, thank you, Dr. Laramore. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, At First Light, a true World War II story of a hero, his bravery, and an amazing horse. At First Light's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And remember to support our indie bookstores. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Walt's books, please visit his website at drwalt.com. On that note, we're going to pause here for a quick moment, and we'll be right back after this message. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.